Um, if you weren't here last week, my name is Allison Lowe, and I'm one of the catechists here at the cathedral. Um, so this tonight, our topic is on the church. So there's a whole lot that can be said, but um, I talk about this in different ways every time I present this topic. So today's a little different than before, but it's similar information. So if you've heard some of this before, hopefully just reiterate some things. And then for those who haven't heard it, hopefully you'll learn some new things about the church. Um, but before we get started, let's just open in prayer and as we gather our hearts and our minds together. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, thank you for the many gifts and blessings you've given us this day and every day. We ask for your forgiveness for all the ways that we have fallen short today and every day, for all the ways that we have failed to give you glory in the things that we do and the way we live our life. We ask for your um, we ask for all different intentions in our hearts. We ask you to send the Holy Spirit into our hearts tonight to enlighten us, to guide us, to help fill our hearts with even more love for you and, and for your church as well. We ask you to give us an increase in grace every day to help us grow closer to you, to convert our hearts more and more every day. And we pray together, our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, and so there are some handouts um, back there. The handouts are largely an outline, but for a lot of the scriptural passages I'll refer to, they're there so you don't have to frantically write them down. There's a few I left off because I wanted to, there's a couple, I don't want to give you, give away all the answers, but there's enough you should write those down. But the majority of them that I'm going to use and refer to are on your handouts with some extra ones. Um, so we're talking about the church tonight. Um, and as I said earlier, there's a lot of different ways that we can approach this. And, and it, I know there's a lot of you with different backgrounds and different uh, levels of how much um, you are as far as your knowledge and different levels of, of conversion and things like that. So um, I just, I was moved to kind of use the method I'm going to use tonight to try to help you understand the church. So hopefully this helps and is helpful for you. But just know there's so much more I can say. And at the end, if there's questions, I'm happy to stick around as long as I need to. But what I thought I would do, and a couple days ago I was kind of moved to say, this is how I should try to introduce it to help you start to get a little glimpse for what we mean by the church as Catholics. And I know some of you are Catholic, some of you are not yet Catholic, but just to give you a glimpse of it. And it's kind of looking at some of the imagery or some of the analogies of the church that Scripture gives to us. So some of these may be true analogies, some of them may be a parable, or some of them may be foreshadowing. And so I want to look at some of those and help you to maybe start to think about how um, God gives us these images to help us learn about his church um, in different ways. So the first image I'm going to talk about is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Actually, before I even go there, let me back up. What are some images you have of the church? Before I pick the ones that I'm going to pick, what are some images or analogies or foreshadowings that you can think of that are in Scripture for the church, how God wants us to see the church? The bride. Okay, the bride. What else? Okay. Body of Christ. Okay. The sheep of the shepherd, the body of Christ. What else? Any others you can think of? Um, living stones. Okay. Living stones. Any others? No? Okay. So I'll have a couple extra beyond that, but those are a good start. So these all are ways, and you can even take these images later, and after seeing how, what I'm going to do tonight, reflect on these things, um, these images that God gives us through Scripture of what his church is like, um, because these analogies can help us to kind of dive deeper into why that analogy was felt to be appropriate. 
Um, so these are some a good start. So the one we're going to start with is 1 Corinthians 12. So 1 first, first Corinthians chapter 12 um, is one of, uh, one of various times that we see Scripture talking about how the church is the body of Christ. So we're going to talk about the body of Christ. And what Scripture tells us is that Jesus is the head. I'm going to draw this little gingerbread man almost. But, and then the church is his body. Okay? So Jesus is the head. And then his church is the body. So I'll put Jesus Christ and then his church. So when we think of this imagery of a human body, both the head and the body kind of united, what do you think, in what ways could this be similar to a church or to a Christ church, the church that Jesus established? What are some similarities between this imagery that you can think of? The body does what the head tells it to do. Okay, so there's this sense of maybe obedience, um, kind of this... But even connection. just will, like my will, hand doesn't okay. have a will of its own. Okay, so united in will. Well, the arms and the legs can be ouch, outshoots, you know, re okay. churches that are forming out. Okay, so Like they did when they spread Christianity. Okay, so it's kind of encompassing... Right. Um, Kind of large group, universal. so universal. Like, kind of like all encompassing right. or universal. Okay, universal. so all encompassing, universal. <coughs> what else? Any other thoughts? So, one of the things that I thought about too was just the idea that the human body is created, and so we can think the church is something that God established, it's something that um, He has created. Um, and then also beyond that too, when we think of a human body, the human body, and St. Paul even make, brings this, draws this analogy out, that the human body has components. It's not just the body. So there's organs, there's blood vessels, there's really small cells, there's different kinds of tissue and muscles. So the body is made up of different types of elements and um, members. Like St. Paul says, the body is composed of many different types of members, and they all do different types of things. And so that also draws out this analogy that this church, the body, contains members who have different gifts and different abilities and different things that they contribute to make the church fruitful. So we can have this idea of there's different members that do different things, but also this sense that the church is not this nebulous thing. It's something where there is a membership. There is this relationship, right? So if we're a member of the church, there's this relational component. Just like the organs have to work together um, in a human body, there's this relational element. So I would say that there's a membership, um, it's relational, and this relational element is also not just with each other, but to the head. So there's this relational with the body and the head, and then also with the different members. So there's a multi-level kind of relation, relational aspect. Um, and we each have, you know, different um, abilities, and I'll just put abilities, but kind of different talents and gifts and things so we can all contribute to that. The other thing that, um, that the body makes you think of is that um, kind of this idea, and one of the images, in a few weeks I'll talk about grace. And grace is a, it's an important topic, and it's something that a lot of people who aren't Catholic or don't understand the Catholic understanding of grace is a very different definition than what a non-Catholic Christian may give for grace. Um, and I'm not going to get into it tonight, but in a couple weeks we'll talk about it. But grace is essentially kind of like the divine life. It's kind of the life of God, and it's something that dwells in us. So it's something that God infuses in us. So it's His own divine life. He infuses it in us. And it's what gives us the ability to have faith, to be obedient, to have, be united. And so if, so, I also like this imagery of the body, because just in my own perspective, I like to think of Christ as the head, and from Christ to all the members, like little blood vessels of grace flowing, right? And then the church, this body, can also kind of offer that to everybody. So you're going to have these blood vessels, um, they kind of transmit grace from Christ to the members, but that becomes important, too, because just like a body, so let's say you have this foot, and let's say that foot becomes infected, and it loses its blood flow, it becomes ischemic in medical terms. It becomes dead. It's a dead foot. It still may be attached to the body, but it's dead. 
Well, the same thing can happen to the members, is that if we put up obstacles so that grace doesn't flow to us, we may be still somewhat technically connected to the body, but, we, but we're spiritually dead because we don't have access to that grace for whatever reason. So you can, have, you can be a member of the church but be spiritually dead. Um, and once you're baptized, you're a member of the church, um, but you're spiritually dead if you lose that grace that Christ is offering, that flows, that he offers to all of us. So there's this sense of you can be a member and be kind of dead, but there's also a sense of the body that um, you can be either outside the body or inside the body. So you can, there can be something, so there can be someone who exists outside and you want to get inside. So there's this sense of we want to become members, we want to somehow enter into the body of Christ. And so that imagery starts to kind of help, help us see that there can be two ways of existing, in the church or out of the church. Um, and so you want to be a member in the church. And so that imagery kind of helps me with that. Um, the other thing, too, is if you amputate your arm, that arm is going to kind of die not being attached to the church. So not only can you kind of remain a living dead limb, you could also be cut off completely from the church. And so your arm, a, a human being has an arm amputated, that arm is no longer part of the body. And so that kind of also gives you this imagery of what can happen to the members of Christ Church um, in an analogous way. Not a perfect analogy, but it starts to make you kind of think about our relationship with the body and with Christ and how there's this interrelatedness, this interconnectedness that's important. Um, let's see. So those are some things that first came to my mind when we think about Christ the head and Christ the body. Another, I guess the final thing I would say too, is when we think about Christ and his being the head with the body, you don't have multiple bodies. You don't have one head attached to multiple bodies. There's this one body. So there's this singularity, exist, the singular existence of the church. So whatever this church is, it's got to have a singularity to it. Um, so there's the singular existence of a church. And then the, the second thing is the church is inseparable from the head. If if the church, you can't have a body that's decapitated, right? If the body's decapitated, it's not going to live. So the head and the body are inseparable, just like Christ and his church are inseparable. Um, and that analogy kind of works that way too. So there's a sense of oneness, of unity, um, of singularity, but also as you talk about all-encompassing, this universality, it's anyone can become a member of this body. Um, it's open to anyone. So there's a sense of universality with that as well. Okay, so that's the, that's kind of the analogy of, of the body. And I'll put so you, um, universal, and I'll put unity. This idea of like oneness. We're going to come back to that these themes a little bit. Uh, singularity, messy, relational, almost kind of like inseparable. Probably important. So, and all of these are important, but I'm going to come back to these a little bit. All right, so that's kind of the imagery of the body of Christ, and those are some ways to begin to understand the church. The second analogy or imagery is going to be from Ephesians chapter 5, um, verse 23 to 32 in that area. And so this is going to be when St. Paul refers to the church as the bride of Christ. And so you know, I mentioned the bride of Christ. And so we see the church as being the bride, and Jesus is the bridegroom. Bridegroom and bride. So Jesus Christ and then his church. Okay. So when you think of a marital relationship, what are some things that you think about? Without even necessarily thinking about the church yet, just in general, when you think of a marital relationship, what are some key elements of a marital relationship? What makes that unique compared to other relationships? To become one. Mm -hmm. All right. So they're uh, okay. So um, they become one flesh. Okay. What else? Love. Okay. What else? So what's the difference between like marriage and friendship, um, or even just? That marital sacrament versus friendship. Commitment. Commitment. Okay, commitment. Yes. Covenant. Covenant. Okay. Mm -hmm. So commitment. 
And I also put under commitment this idea of like faithfulness, like fidelity. Mm -hmm. So fidelity. And then covenant's a big one, so covenant. What else? Blessed by God. Okay. Blessed. And in what way are they blessed? There's one particular thing I'm looking for. What's what's one unique blessing to a man and a woman? Children. Uh-huh. Okay, so the fruitfulness. fruitfulness. Um, and you've kind of all hinted at this, but this intimacy, like this relationship is very more, much more intimate than other relationships may be. Um, see, this is kind of a good, good summary of some of the things I thought about too. Um, and so when we think of the church now, we want to think about these same ideas because let's focus on covenant first. What is a covenant? So a covenant is very different than a contract. So a covenant is really an exchange of persons. A contract would be an exchange of goods. I may have a house, you give me money, I give you the house. But with a covenant, it's an exchange of persons. It's two persons committing um, to each other fully of themselves. And in marriage, the husband and wife fully commit themselves to the other. I will give my husband everything, and he will give me everything. It's this intimacy where the two truly become one, both physically, but also emotionally, spiritually, you're, you're sharing things about your life, um, you know, and so you're, you're giving each other fully. You're willing to sacrifice for the other. I mean, it's this real full commitment of selflessness um, and of yourself. And so a covenant is that way. And so a covenant also has, um, and we'll talk more about this in a minute with the next analogy, but the covenant also has expectations, right? So in the marriage covenant, you're expected to be faithful and you're expected to be exclusive. If you go and, and have intimate relationships with someone other than your spouse, you're, being, you're breaking that covenant that you promised. So you're vowing this significant bond for life. It's this lifelong bond um, of love to that person. And so with the church, it's the same, same thing. So with the church and with Christ, there is a covenant that forms. And the church as a whole forms that covenant with Christ. And then each of us as members are participating in this covenant. And so each of us do have expectations. There is a sense we need to be faithful. We need to be obedient. We need to um, be committed, um, exclusive, right? And so um, with, the, with our commitment to this covenant, um, Christ is always going to be faithful. He is never going to break a promise. He is never going to lie or cheat or, cheat or do anything against, against us from the covenant. So we know that he's 100% all in. And so then the question is for us. And we're the ones who are fickle. We're the ones who throughout our life are going to have a spiritual battle every single day, having to make this commitment and conversion every day to be committed to this relationship, to this covenant. But we know that our partner, who's Christ, will never be faithful, no, never be unfaithful. He's always going to be 100% committed. And so we have that, but it's not easy. And sometimes we're faced with the various temptations and things. So it is a struggle. But the good thing is our partner in this relationship, Christ gives us everything we need to be faithful. His gift of grace, his life, he offers it fully so we can be faithful. So we know he is giving us everything we need. We just have to be open and receptive so that he can transform us and change us and help us grow in that relationship. So there's this covenant between Christ and the church. Um, there's this sense, too, of commitment and fidelity. There's also a fruitfulness. So the church is fruitful. If the, um, the church at work in the world is Christ working through the church. And if the church and all of us individually allow Christ to work through us, we can be fruitful. We can have conversions. Even if we don't convert hearts, we can preach the gospel. We can um, show people what great love looks like and what God's love looks like by how we act. Um, just even look in the early church, the pagans were impressed with the Christians because of the love they would show anybody. Like during the time of the plagues, oftentimes the Christians would stay behind. When the family members would, would, would flee and just leave their sick, sick loved ones behind, the Christians would stay. And many pagans converted to Christianity because they saw this love for strangers. It was just unbelievable. And so it was reflecting God's love for these people. Um, you know, Mother Teresa, a good, good witness for that, too, of just showing people love. And so we can be fruitful in the world if we are faithful to this relationship with Christ. So, um, and then the intimacy. 
Christ does want a personal, intimate relationship with us. And not just with me, but with me and all of the community. Both singularly, he wants a relationship with me individually, but also with me as a member of his church. So there's kind of this, it's not just me and Christ, but it is me and Christ, but it's also the community. I'm also a part of a community that's incredibly important um, because God made us to be social creatures. He didn't make us to be individuals. Who, the only thing I worry about is me. It's, yes, I need my own relationship with Christ, and I need to be doing everything I can to influence those people's or people around me so I can try to save my soul and save others as well, at least be an instrument of salvation for others so that Christ can work through me. Um, all right. This also kind of reiterates the inseparability of Christ in the church. It reiterates the relational aspect, um, this unity and oneness, um, and even just the singularity of it, because the bridegroom does not have multiple brides. The bridegroom has a singular bride. And same with the bride, just a singular bridegroom. If we start to put other things in our life as more important than God, and fall into the sin of idol idolatry, whether it's power or success or human relationships or whatever it may be, we're putting, we're, we're kind of joining ourselves to a different bridegroom. And so there's this sense of um, singularity with the relationship um, that's there. Um, okay. So that's all I'm going to say about that relationship. But again, you can start to continue to reflect on it and think about it and start to draw out even more kind of thoughts about the church through that imagery. All right. Um, I'm erase this one. And so I'm going to just put it closer over here. So the bridegroom and bride. I had some of these same key elements. <clears throat> the next um, imagery, if you want to call it that. So in Galatians chapter 6, verse 16, there's a very interesting comment that St. Paul makes. And sometimes it's overlooked. But what St. Paul talks about, it's he's, in, he's concluding his letter to the Galatians, but he connects the church as the new Israel of God, basically. He's talking about the church, it says the Israel of God. So there's this sense that the church is the new Israel of God. And so I want to use Israel as kind of a foreshadowing. So it's the new Israel of God. So the church is the new Israel of God. So I want to look at Israel and see how Paul could be connecting the church with Israel. So tell me some things about Israel, the chosen people of God. What are some things about the chosen people of God? You don't have to compare it to the church yet. Just what are some things you remember um, from the Old Testament and from things like the relationship between God and Israel or maybe just some individual um, details about, about this group of people? What do you remember? Well, they weren't always faithful to God. Okay. So they were not always faithful. They were called to be faithful, right? Right. So put called to be faithful. What else? They're also called to do something else. Do you remember what they were? There's another thing they were called to do that they failed tremendously to do. Um, they were called to not have kings. Okay, so they were called not to have kings. Why? Because God was their only king. Was right. The king. So, God was king. Mm -hmm. right. So they eventually do ask for a king and God will give them one. But yeah, they were called not to have kings. Um, but what about their relationship with the world? What were they supposed to do um, with be separate. other nations? Be separate, but what? So they were also to be a light to the world. So they weren't supposed to turn in and only worry about themselves. They do that. They were supposed to show God to the world. And the reason God made that, you know, holy, holy is this idea of being called or being set apart. Um, sacred means to be set apart. And holy is kind of this idea of you're set apart. Well, they're set apart so that they can reflect God to the world and so they can be a light for God so that he can guide them so that through them the world can come to know God. Um, but in many places you can kind of see that they really fell short of being a light to the world. But they're called to be a light to the world. 
Um, so called be faithful and a light to the world, to really kind of basically to evangelize and let people, let all the nations know about God. <clears throat> okay, what else? What was um, important to the relationship with God? That he be their only God. Okay, he be their only God. And so that's a part of what? Of the faithful. Um, yeah, the circumcision, so being faithful, what's that a part of? Those are covenant. Mm -hmm. covenant. Right, so covenant. Abrahamic covenant. Yeah. Right. So there was a covenant, and so you have a covenant that forms with Abraham. There's a covenant that will form with Moses and the Israelites. And so you'll see these different in a covenant with David. So there's a couple different covenants that God will form with them. But they are definitely, this, there's this emphasis on covenant, this covenant relationship with God. And as a part of that covenant, Again, just like with marriage, there are expectations. Um, well, there were laws, I mean, but the laws were not to be dictatorial or tyrannical. The laws were to help guide the people to live the way God had made them to be. So the laws are really supposed to be these guiding posts to help them live and be fruitful and to, be, to flourish and to fulfill their calling. So there are these laws that are part of the covenant. And again, just like in marriage, this covenant is an exchange of persons. So it's a huge commitment of the person giving themselves fully to God. Um, and so that was the same understanding at that point. Um, the covenant also had blessings and curses. And so if you failed to live up to the covenant, there would be curses. And you would definitely experience exile. You may have physical or emotional um, consequences for that. There's also blessings. If you remain faithful, there'd be some blessings to that. Um, what's eventually drawn out by Christ, too, is that just because you might suffer um, a various ailment doesn't mean you're necessarily unfaithful to the covenant. But there is this emphasis in the Old Testament of just trying to help the people understand there are consequences in your relationship to God. Not just physical, earthly consequences, but spiritual, supernatural, eternal consequences. But so the covenant has these blessings and curses. Um, what else about Israeli people? Tell me about their community. Um, how how were they organized? Tribes. Tribes. Okay. Twelve tribes. All right. Yep. So there are twelve tribes. Okay. And then what was also unique about them? Not necessarily unique to the pagan country or the pagan nations. Sometimes do these things too. But also some things we think about when we think about Israel. What's what's what are what's kind of the um, one of the most important things to a Jewish person at that time, or at the time of Jesus even, was what? What place? Oh, the temple. The temple. The temple. The, right. The temple. So the temple, and what did the temple have? Why would, um, what would happen in the temple? It had, it had, what would happen in the temple? Sacrifice. Sacrifices. Right. So there were sacrifices, and there was a priesthood. And so the Jewish people had a priesthood, which was very important. Um, and then they would have sacrifices. These sacrifices could be peace offerings, thanksgiving offerings, sin offerings. So they would take things to the priest for, so that God would forgive their sins through that priest, right? So, you would, so a man would take some type of offering and, and tell the priest that this is the sin he's done. And then God said that once he made that offering, he would forgive the man through the priest. Um, so this priesthood would sacrifice his 12 tribes. Um, so these are some of the things to think about. Now, St. Paul also calls our attention to a few of the things about them. Um, I'm going to erase these. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it's a very interesting passage because Paul uses the, he's going to refer to something um, that's called typology, which I love. It's one of my, it's just one of my favorite things, but typology is this idea that there's things in the Old Testament that foreshadow the new, right? And so just like Adam, you have the first Adam, Jesus is the new Adam. Um, just like you have um, um, Joseph. Joseph is kind of a foreshadowing of Jesus. Same with Moses is a foreshadowing of Jesus. So there's this foreshadowing where God intentionally puts people and places and events that happen in time. They actually did happen because God is the creator of all things, and he know, he, and there are things with a purpose. He does things with a purpose. So some of these Old Testament people and places and things are to foreshadow things to come. 
And what we can, and when we know what finally happens, we can learn from the past even more about some of the things that happen. So Augustine talks about how you know you can uh, the the Old Testament is fulfilled in the New, and then and you can find the New and the Old. And there's this interconnection. And so typology is this idea of that. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul is going to say this is a type for us. And what he's referring to is Israel, and he's specifically referring to the wilderness journey. So he talks about how Moses led them out of Egypt across the Red Sea. So there's the water. And then they're in this wilderness journey, and then they're on their way to the promised land. I'm just going to put initials. The promised land, and then you have the Red Sea here. And so they were in slavery, and then he led them across to freedom. So they went across to freedom, and then they journeyed to the promised land. And within this period of time, they had trials. I mean, they were tested. They were tempted. They faltered a lot. So they would, um, I'll just put, uh, they would sin. Um, so they would be faithful, be unfaithful, obey, disobey. There was this constant spiritual battle that they experienced throughout this ongoing journey. Um, but Paul also tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he also talks about how God sustained them and how God nourished them throughout this time. And Paul says that he, God gave them supernatural food. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And supernatural food. And, and Paul says supernatural drink. So food and drink. And so the food was the manna and the quail. So every morning there would be manna on the ground. Every night they would have flesh. So in the Old Testament kind of verse, there's flesh, which is quail. So they would have the bread and the flesh that would miraculously be there every day. And then they would have the water from the rock that was miraculously provided to them when they needed it. So Paul refers to it as the supernatural food and the supernatural drink that nourished them throughout their journey on the way to the promised land. And then Paul talks about how it wasn't easy for them, they failed a lot, and he, he says that this is a warning for you, speaking to Christians, this is a warning for you, because you too could fall away, and you may not enter in the promised land, just like many of the Israelites never made it, because of their unfaithfulness and their disobedience, you too might not make it to the promised land. And so he's giving... Um, Paul's giving us this foreshadowing, this analogy of the Is Israelites and their experience with us as Christians. And so how does this compare to us? So what is our slavery? Sin. Right, so our slavery is sin. And how are we freed from sla our slavery to sin? What do we pass through? The waters of us? Right, so the waters of baptism. So there's this foreshadowing that the Red Sea is like the waters of baptism, where we're gone, we would go from slavery to sin to freedom. Right, and this is freedom in Christ. So it's not just free to live however you, however you want, but it's the freedom in Christ. And then what's our promised land? Heaven. Right, heaven. Not very good arrow. So heaven. So this is our time now. And Paul talks about how we too can be tested and tempted. We too can fall into sin. And we too could fall away if we're not careful. We need to be cautious and be constantly striving to be faithful. So if we see all these other analogies, what is our supernatural food and supernatural drink? Mm. The Eucharist. Eucharist. So, so Paul, recognize, Paul doesn't draw this out, but he knows that his audience understands this. And in 1 Corinthians 11, he's going to talk about the Eucharist anyway. She's about to talk about the Eucharist, but supernatural food and supernatural drink is going to be bread and wine, so this nourishment, and this bread's going to be flesh, right? So there's even some hints of that there, foreshadowing it, but the supernatural food, the supernatural drink that we too can partake of in our earthly journey that is going to be able to help us get to heaven. So it's this spiritual nourishment to help us get to heaven. And so just like the Israelites, we can see this analogy with the church. Um, that was um, at that point too. Okay. And then you can also even draw out some of these similar um, highlights with Israel. So Israel also was relational. 
There's this idea of unity and oneness. You want to be one of the chosen people of God had to be in this covenant, and you were either in the covenant and one of the chosen people of God, or not. You're one of the, the pagans. There's a little bit of a in between. You could be a, um, a God fearer, and you kind of see that more in the New Testament times, where you have these Gentiles who believed in God but did not quite yet make all the steps to become Jewish. But um, but for the most part, you kind of were Jewish or not Jewish. So you're in the covenant or out of the covenant. There's this sense that there is this singularity. Now, one of the things that Jesus says when he talks to us about things, he says, I have come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Yeah. So we can also think that when these analogies exist like Israel, and it's fulfilled in the church, there's going to be even a um, more profound experience. So even though Israel is kind of this one group of people, you know, and I'll show you other places too, we're going to see that the church becomes this universal um, this universal church where anyone's welcome, um, Jew or Gentile, you know, free or slave, woman or man, just like Paul says. So it's universal. There's this singularity, this oneness. So the church is going to be a fulfillment of Israel, so it's going to be even more profound than what we can learn just by reflecting on that. And then before I get to my last analogy, on your handout I did put how I keep emphasizing this idea of unity and oneness and even this universality that no matter who you are, you're invited into this church, whether you live in the year 100 AD or in 2020, or whether you live in Tyler, Texas, or in Finland, you're welcome into this church and invited into this church. So the universality is across space, but also across time. So there is no limit to this. It's kind of, um, there's, it's not geographical or spatial or temporal. Everyone's welcome into this church. And so there's this, this universality is even bigger than we think. It's not just right now universal, but even across time. So whoever was in the church in the year 100 should be believing the same thing and should be united to Christ in the same way um, 2,000 years later. So there's this connectedness in that way also. But on your handouts, I put some scripture passages that really try to emphasize this oneness, this unity. And Paul talks a lot about it, um, about how we need to be um, united in one body and not have dissensions or difficulties. And um, we should all be of the same mind if we're members of this church. Okay. All right. Questions about those? Alright, so we're going to do the final analogy, which I think is the most important. At least, yeah, I think it's the most important. Alright, so this last one's not only imagery or an analogy, and it's literally what the church is. Um, but we're going to first approach it from this imagery standpoint. So um, this example, I'm going to see if you can figure out what it is. So this example, I think, is one of the most important images of the church. It helps you really start to understand a little bit more about the church, too. Um, and we can see a hint at, at it every time we look at the crucifix. So every time we look at the crucifix, there's a hint on there about a description of the church. Um, and it's related to the little placard above Jesus' head. What does that placard say or refer to? King of the Jews. Right. So it says, like, I-N-R-I. So, Jesus Nazarenus Rex Eudorum, right? Eudorum. So it means Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. So what does it tell us about Jesus there? And, you know, the Jews got really angry that that was even there, but Pilate left it. I think it's, it's all providential. It was a, there's a purpose. Um, and so God wanted to tell us something about, about who Jesus was. Um, so what does what's it tell us? He's a king. He's a king. All right. So what does every king mean? Subjects. Okay, subjects. What else? What's he step even back for subjects? A kingdom. A kingdom. Right. So every king means a kingdom. A governmental relationship. <laughs> so you wouldn't have, you wouldn't call someone a king if there was no kingdom. So we, it already tells us that, that he's a king and he has a kingdom. So what is this kingdom? Where do we find this kingdom? Because I want to be a part of it, wherever this kingdom is. 
Okay, so that's the first thing to think about. Then in Revelation chapter 19, 16, John has a vision of heaven, and in his vision he sees Jesus with these robes, and written on there it says, King of kings and Lord of lords, kind of reiterating that he's a king. Um, Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15, also says that's so Revelation 19, 16, and then 1 Timothy 6, 15, kind of reiterate, Jesus is the king of kings and Lord of lords. So there's an important emphasis on him being a king. So it just helps to reiterate, we may be looking for this kingdom. If he's our king, let's look for this kingdom. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, there's a prophecy. And Daniel has this dream, and he interprets the dream. And basically, it's a prophecy about the Messiah. And Daniel, in his dream, saw the Son of Man come down from heaven, and he comes to reign. And he's given an everlasting king. He, he's named, he's, we're told he's an everlasting king with this everlasting kingdom. And all nations shall serve him, and his kingdom will never be destroyed. So he's a king with a kingdom, and we're told they're everlasting. All nations will serve him, but also it will never be destroyed. I don't know, but all nations. So there's this sense of it being universal in this prophecy, this kingdom. And then when you start to look in the New Testament, you see kingdom references everywhere. So with the first time we enter Jesus, we, we encounter Jesus coming into public ministry, what's one of the first things that we hear John Baptist saying? He says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So again, Matthew 3, 2. And then when John the Baptist is beheaded, one of the things Jesus says is, repent for the kingdom is at hand. That's in Matthew 4, 17. And so there's this repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Um, so the first time we encounter Jesus publicly in his ministry, there's this kingdom connection. And then whenever you look at all the different ways kingdom is referred to, sometimes kingdom is referring to heaven. So sometimes there's this sense that it's the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven that's in the next life. Sometimes it is that. But it's not always strictly about heaven. So in Jesus' parables, when he's talking about the kingdom... There's an important parable in Matthew 13, verse 24, 24 and 37, around that area. So Matthew 13, 24, 37, this, area, this section. And it's about the man who has a field. And we're to told that he goes and he sows his seeds in the field and then goes to sleep. And then overnight, the enemy sneaks in and plants some weeds in the field. And the next morning, the plants come up, and everyone sees there's both wheat and weeds. Uh, where people say the wheat and the tares in the field. So there's good seed and bad seed. There's the good fruit and the bad fruit. And the servants ask, well, what do we do? Oh my gosh, you know, there's weeds in here. Let's go dig them out. And, and the farmer says, no, because if you dig out the, the bad, you may take some of the good with it. So you wait until the harvest day. And we'll get them all out at once, and then we'll separate them. And he said, and Jesus says, "This my kingdom is like this." So the very beginning of that parable, my kingdom is like this: a man sows the field. So his kingdom is like a field that has both the good and the bad. Could that be heaven? No. No. So he has to be talking about something else. It doesn't mean that. The kingdom on earth is completely separate than the kingdom of heaven, but it means the kingdom on earth is a little different in the sense that you could still have some of the bad that still exist in time on, and during this earthly life. And at the, on the last day, it's going to be separated, um, and then the bad will be um, harvested out. But there's this sense of the kingdom right here and right now is bad and good, together, growing up together in the kingdom, in the field. So it tells us that sometimes when the kingdom is referenced, it also can, it's this earthly existence of the kingdom too. Um, not just strictly heaven, because the good and the bad. In Matthew 13, 47, it's the same idea. He says, my kingdom is like the net that's caught fish, and there's the good fish and the bad fish in the same net. My kingdom is like this. And he's referring to the earthly um, existence of his kingdom. And again, the kingdom of heaven and earth aren't separate, 
but there they do there there is this distinction because of the top earthly element of it. Because the kingdom of heaven is perfected, so all the members of the kingdom of heaven have been made perfect. The members here are still imperfect and still struggle and fickle and still in the midst of the spiritual battle. So we, we get the sense that this kingdom, just kind of showing you there is some evidence the kingdom is here. So we should be looking for it here and not just waiting um, until heaven. And then Matthew 13, Matthew 13 has a lot of parables about the kingdom, but um, Matthew 13, around 31, 32, he says, my kingdom is like a mustard seed. It's the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it's the greatest shrubs. And then it becomes like a tree, and the birds of the air come, and they nest in its branches. So this teeny tiny little seed starts out really small, but over time it becomes gigantic, and the birds can find it and nest in it and rest in its branches. So we said this kingdom is like a mustard seed. Okay, so the mustard seed. Now when, you, when I read the parable about the mustard seed, it calls to mind another prophecy of Daniel. And in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, it's a very interesting prophecy that connects to this mustard seed prophecy in a way. And so in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, so the background is this during the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar. And King Nebuchadnezzar has this dream, and he's bothered by it. You probably remember the story. And he's like, I do not know. I'm very bothered and disturbed. I want someone to interpret it. But for me to trust you, you have to tell me what the dream was first, yeah. and then interpret it. Right? So people come, and no one can do it until Daniel comes forward. And God has revealed to Daniel what the dream was and what it meant. And so in the, I'm going to try to just go through this quick for time, but in the dreams you have a giant, it's a, he's going to see this giant statue. Nebuchadnezzar sees this giant statue. And the head was of gold. Uh, I'll just put gold, just to shorten it. And then um, the breast and the arms were silver, right, so silver. And then the belly and the thigh. So you have a little bit of, uh, I should probably put that there. And you have the belly and the thigh. Iron. Um, they were bronze. And then the legs were iron. Legs, iron. Yeah, that's good. And then the feet. Clay and iron. Yeah, yeah, clay and iron. So iron plus clay. So it's a funky looking statue, but good. Okay. Um, okay, so then what happens? A big hammer comes? There's a teeny tiny little stone. Oh, excuse me. Right? So this stone comes. And the stone was not made by human hands. And it appears. And it strikes the statue at its feet. And then the statue breaks into pieces and falls apart. Right? And all the pieces fall apart and the wind carries it all off. But the stone remains. And what is the stone? What happens to the stone? It becomes this giant mountain that fills the whole earth. The stone becomes a giant mountain that fills the whole earth. And then Daniel tells the king what this means. He says, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, is the head. And after him will arise an inferior kingdom, and then a third, and then a fourth. And then the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed nor shall its sovereignty be left to another people. And it shall break into pieces all the kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will stand forever. And so the Jewish people even realized what these represented. So Nebuchadnezzar was Babylon. That was around the 6th century BC. So uh, Babylon, just to, I don't like to write it all, but the 6th century is Babylon. And then followed by them were the, in the 5th century BC, were the Medo-Persians. Then in the 4th century, um, I think I skipped one, but, oh yeah, so I think the Medo-Persians are here. Um, so see the Babylon, 6th century, Medo-Persians, 5th century. Then the Greeks were the 4th, I know the Greeks are here. So these must be the 5th century, the Medo-Persians. So Medo-Persians. It's not significant. The key thing is right here, because this is Rome, the Roman Empire. And so the Roman Empire um, appears in the first century BC. And during this time, 
this stone's going to appear. So at the time of Christ, the Jewish people were in very much, they were very much anticipating, they know that Messiah is coming. That Messiah is coming soon. Um, they don't know exactly when, but it's going to be during this Roman Empire. And then when um, Gabriel appears to Daniel, there's other clues that it's happening soon. And so there's this element of expectation that's very high in the, in the first century when Jesus comes. And so they know God's going to do something really miraculous um, and send this stone to destroy the Roman Empire. That's how come some Jews even thought this may be like a political takeover, that there'll be some type of um, earthly kingdom God will set up if he's going to destroy Rome. So anyway, so this godly kingdom is going to come during the time of the Roman Empire, and it's going to destroy all the other kingdoms. So God's going to intervene in some way. And so this stone is going to start off very small, this kingdom that's going to come. But over time, it's going to become like this mountain, and visible, and it's going to span across the entire world for all to see. And it'll become larger and larger and larger over time. So it also, that's why it kind of reminds me of this mustard seed that starts off really small, and over time it becomes big. And so this kingdom imagery again starts to give us some indications of what this kingdom that Jesus is going to establish is going to do, or what we can expect from it. It may start off small, but over time it's going to expand across the whole earth and fill the whole earth and be this giant mountain. Now some people may say, well, okay, Christ is going to set up a kingdom that does that, but how are you telling me that the church is the same thing as this kingdom? Maybe they're separate, maybe they're different. Well, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, which we're going to dive into in a minute, but in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus is going to connect his church with the kingdom. And I'll, we'll go over that passage in a minute specifically, but um, he basically says, you know, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will never, never prevail against it, and I will give you the keys to the kingdom, and what you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, so on. So we're going to come back to that. But the key thing is he's connecting the church and the kingdom in this passage. There's this suggestion that they're the same. Um, they're in the same context of what Jesus is talking about with Peter. And plus he says, you know, his church is never going to be destroyed, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So it kind of starts to hint that you're going to have this kingdom that's not ever going to be destroyed, um, and that's going to, going to be like this kingdom that starts in the time of the Roman Empire, really tiny, but over time it will grow. So we see this connection between the church and the kingdom. So having said that, that the church is this kingdom, what are some things about a kingdom not, don't connect it to the church just yet, but when you think of the kingdom, what do you think about? What, what characteristics are there about a kingdom? How do you know something is a kingdom? What are some things you'll, you might see in a kingdom? What besides the king? Had, yeah. A singular head. Okay, so you'll have the king. And so how about let's say like a hierarchy, maybe? Yeah. Okay, so a hierarchy. What else? Subjects. Okay, subjects. Castles. Which thing? Castles. Castles. <laughs> well, I mean, mm -hmm. kings live in castles. Sure. Um, does the king always exist by himself? No. No. Who, who might be close to a king? Queen. No. Okay, queen. Okay, what else? Servants. Servants. Okay. Well, can I, I'll leave those with subjects. What about, what, what, are, what are some of the expectations of living in a kingdom or being a part of a kingdom? You have protection. Obedience. Protection. Okay, obedience. Yes. Protection, obedience. What else? Any things you can think about? Probably have more well, protection of law and order in them. Is some kind of hierarchy mm -hmm. or yeah, some yeah. type of so, yeah, protocols, protocols and rules and protocols. And protocols. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. But you have to you may have the well mixed with the poor, you'll have both. And in a in like a in a perfect kingdom, they're gonna they're gonna share live together and, and help each other and, and kind of not necessarily be subjects to each other in a, in a, in a negative way, in a, um, a way that's kind of oppressive. So you might have the wealthy and you might have the poor, but they're living together in a perfect kingdom. Storehouses. Okay, yeah, so storehouses. Um, good. Okay, so that's a good start. So if this is kind of what we think about with a kingdom, then what are some things that may not surprise us about if the church, which is described as a kingdom, might have. Um, so before we answer that, I also want to kind of point out that the Jewish people were very familiar with kingdoms. 
So what they lived, so for the Jewish people, so there was the Davidic kingdom. So the king of David. So um, as was mentioned earlier, God didn't really want the Israelites to have a king. But they eventually wanted one because all the other countries did. So Saul was the first king, but he wasn't the most faithful. And so then God appoints David, who had his problems, just like all of us. He was human. But he was kind of the chosen, this chosen king, um, kind of a man after God's own heart, basically, um, as, he, as the scripture says. So David has this special calling to be the king, the second king of Israel. So in this Davidic kingdom, you would have many of these same things. You had a king and a queen. So I'll put the king and queen. Um, you had this hierarchy. So there was a hierarchy. There were different people in charge of different things, and um, you had subjects. And so pretty much all of this applied to the Davidic kingdom. So the Jews would, be, would have been familiar with this. One of the things that's specific about the hierarchy in the um, Davidic kingdom, in addition to the, the king and the queen that had a, a unique role, there was also kind of what's akin to a prime minister. Um, and so in Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22, there's clear mention of this, but a prime minister, and it's almost kind of like the idea of a president, vice president in America, um, or if you go to um, Europe, a little more familiar with prime minister, but it's still, it's a different role than like the prime minister in England today. This was a different relationship with the king. It's more kind of like a president, vice president in a way. And so it, it's kind of akin to a prime minister. He was kind of more just called like an administrator, but some people call him like a... Um, a vicar, or they would call him like a steward of the household. Um, steward of the household. Can I see different references to that? And Isaiah chapter 22, we're told about this position because there's this man named Shebna who has not been faithful, and, and God is really upset with him. So Shebna, God replaces Shebna with a man named Iliakim. And so in this transition that happens, we're told a little bit more about this position. And we're told the prime minister, he has this special robe and this special sash that show that he's unique, has unique authority in the kingdom. And what we're told is that he is always given the key to the kingdom. And it says, you know, what he shuts, none shall open. What he opens, none, stop, none shall shut. But it's this imagery of he, he gets to be an administrator. He gets to discuss judicial things, discipline things. His role is especially important when the king has to go away. So let's say the king has to go fight a war. Or the king has to go to another country for a treaty. When the king is away, the prime minister is in charge. And the people are to treat him just as they would the king. And Isaiah tells us that people would even call him their father. Um, he was their father. And so there's a sense that he has this very important role in authority, especially when the king is away. But he'd be called father. Um, he would have this special clothing that people could recognize who he was, the robe, the sash. But he had important authority, especially when the king was away. Um, and he was given the key of the kingdom. And people were to listen to him. They were supposed to obey him because he would speak for the king, basically, when the king was away. All right, so if we look at this picture of what a, uh, the average Jewish person is very familiar with this idea, and so Jesus is introducing this idea that the church is a kingdom, so we won't be surprised if some of these same things are expected. Let's start with one of the more subtle things. In the Old Testament, in the Davidic kingdom, who was the queen? Right, so when Solomon was king, we know that Solomon wasn't always the best. He had a lot of wives, even though he wasn't supposed to. Um, so Solomon, in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 13, 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 13, it's proven to us that uh, who the queen is because we see her. Um, but David and Bathsheba, their son was Solomon. When Solomon was king, Bathsheba was queen. So she was always called the queen mother. She would have the king, and he may have a wife, Preferably only one, but the king would have a wife, but the wife wasn't queen. It was the queen mother. So in this church kingdom that Christ establishes, if Jesus is the king, who's the queen mother? Mary. Mary. So it shouldn't surprise you that sometimes you may hear Catholics refer to her as queen mother. 
because she is the queen mother. It doesn't mean that she is God. It doesn't mean that she's all-powerful. It doesn't mean that she's divine. It's because of her relationship with Christ. She is Christ's mother. And by being her mother, she is now given this unique role in the kingdom of being queen mother. Sometimes you may also hear her referred to as queen of heaven because that kingdom is perfected in heaven. So she is queen of heaven because she's still Jesus' mother. That relationship isn't ended with death. It's not destroyed with death. Our relationships with all of our families and friends won't be destroyed with death. It'll be even more perfect. Um, and so the queen mother, so she's queen of heaven because that kingdom continues. But it doesn't mean she's divine. It doesn't mean she's all powerful. It doesn't mean that she can work miracles. You can ask her to keep praying for you. Just, and that's, I know some non-Catholics don't understand that, but those in heaven we don't believe have stopped caring or stopped loving. Their love is now perfected for us. Just like my love for you wants me to pray for you, it doesn't end. God allows that to continue in heaven. They God will let them know some things. So we know that God, it's not their power of being able to understand what, that we're asking to pray for us, but God gives them this, those in heaven this ability. Um, and we can maybe talk about that at the end of class if there's more questions about the prayers, but but that's why Mary continues to pray for us and continues to love us. Um, and in 1 Kings, we're shown that this citizen of the kingdom, he has this issue. And he really wants the king to do him a favor. But he doesn't go directly to the king. He first goes to the queen mother, because that was proper. You didn't just go to the king with your question or with your problem. You would first go to the queen mother and say, Queen Bathsheba, will you please ask your son, the king, to do this for me? And then she would go and ask him. Now, in this case, the king said no. Um, but the same thing is with Mary. If, if, if Bathsheba was the queen mother who had listened to requests from the citizens and handed on to the king, it's the same idea. It's not exactly the same in heaven because the only way she hears us is through God's, God giving her this ability. But same with all the saints. I mean, there's a similar thing. God's, it's God's power, um, not, their, not their own individual personal power. Uh, but the Queen Mother has this very important role of intercession, and she loves the citizens, loves the people of the kingdom, and wants them to flourish. And so it shouldn't be surprising that Mary is this Queen Mother. Okay. Now, what else would it not be surprising to see in our kingdom? So citizens obeying the king, citizens expecting to be faithful, citizens having these laws and guidelines and rules to obey, um, you know, having these, the, maybe these different parts of the kingdom, different locations, but still being one kingdom. So like someone said, the castles, they may be in different locations geographically, but they're still one kingdom. There's still this sense of unity and oneness in it. Um, and this sense of universality. So wherever you go, you can be a part of this kingdom. Um, it's not limited by ge geography or time. But we can also think of this, this stone in, that becomes that mountain. So if the church is this kingdom, is this church going to be this invisible group of people that people have to may, may not know where to look for it? I think Daniel's prophecy tells us it'll be this mountain that fills the whole earth. It seems to be the suggestion is visible in some way. Maybe the kingdom as a whole has some elements that aren't visible, but there are some elements that seem to suggest it's got to be visible that's going to start off with this tiny stone and then fill the whole earth. That prophecy doesn't guarantee it'll be visible, but it suggests maybe. It wouldn't be surprising if it's visible. You could still argue that, well, it's just the invisible, all the believers of the church make up that kingdom and it's invisible. And I know some non-Catholics do hold that. So you could still see that, but I still think there's a suggestion. The stone becomes this mountain, it's visible. Same with the mustard seed. The mustard seed with this tiny seed that becomes this tree, the birds can what? They can go find it and rest in its branches. So there's a the hint that maybe this church's kingdom is in some way visible, that you can know where to go and where to look for it. Um, and what about the administrators? This hierarchy. So would it surprise you if there's a hierarchy in the church, if this church is a kingdom? No. So it may not be surprising to see there's different people who have different roles. And some of it may just be, even like St. Paul says, you know, some are teachers, some are evangelists, some are prophets. But there can even be like a governance of authority or a hierarchy like the bishops and the deacons and the priests. It may not surprise you if that's there. Seeing the church as a kingdom does not then say, oh, we know there's a hierarchy, but it wouldn't surprise you if you ultimately discover that there was a hierarchy in there. 
So now I want to spend a little time about this hierarchy a little bit more. So if the Davidic kingdom with the King David had this queen mother, and then it had this really important person called the prime minister or akin to a prime minister, do we see Jesus establishing this anywhere? Do we see Jesus maybe giving a person a key? Or giving a person some unique authority? Used to sure. the, kingdom. the apostles. Yeah, apostles. So the apostles. Mm -hmm. so, he, so Jesus is going to do two things. Um, let me start with, yeah, we'll start with Peter. Okay. So there's, Jesus is going to talk to the apostles as a group, and then he'll also talk to Peter individually. So in Matthew 16, 18, and then Matthew 18, 18. So in Matthew 16, 18, this is when um, all the, so all the apostles are together. All the apostles are still together. This is still part of the same conversation with Jesus and his apostles. But Jesus will call out Peter specifically here and uniquely speak to him. And then he's going to speak to the all 12 together, Peter and the other 11 here. So this will be Jesus speaking specifically to Peter. This one is Peter plus the 11. Okay. Now, if you recall, in Isaiah chapter 22, I talked about how this prime minister um, existed in the kingdom, and I had said that here, here one of the, I'm going to kind of just paraphrase what it says in Isaiah 22. It says, um, this is God kind of talking about the replacement for Shebna, Iliacum. He says, I will give him the key of the house of David. What he shall open, none shall shut, and what he shall shut, none shall open. And I will make him a ruler in a sure place. Okay, so this idea of this key to the house of David, this idea of he's going to have this authority to, once he shuts something, they can't open it. Once he opens it, they can't close it. It's, it's a um, kind of a, um, just a figurative way of speaking about authority, but he says that. Well, in Matthew 16, 18, what does Jesus say to Peter? So Jesus asks them, you know, who do people say that I am? And they all say different things, Elijah and Jeremiah. And then... Simon, the Apostle Simon, he says, you are Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus is going to um, praise him for that. And then a few verses later, he says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. And, um, and I'm going to just skip to, he says, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And so there's a lot to say about this passage, but I'm going to highlight a few things. First of all, when Jesus says, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. It's singular. There's this singularity about the church. Okay, and then the gates of Hades shall not prevail. There's this sense that it will not be destroyed. It's going to be protected in some way. And then Jesus says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom, and that you in Greek is singular. I will give you, referring to Peter, the keys of the kingdom. And he says, whatever you, and that's again singular, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you, singular, loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So there's this sense that P Jesus has called Peter out, uniquely speaking to him, and giving him this unique authority in some way. Now, he's going to say something similar to all the apostles, too. In Matthew 18, 18, he's going to have, he's going to look at all of them now, all 12. And he says, I say unto you, whatsoever you, and it's plural in the Greek, whatsoever you all, basically, whatever you all bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you all shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So again, it's this sense of authority but now it's given to the twelve as a group. It's kind of a, a group um, gift. But there's also still this singular, singular gift to Peter you can't ignore. So it seems like there's two things that Jesus is doing. And there's this obscure thing about binding and loosing. So to us it's kind of weird. But to a Jewish person it would not have been foreign. So for the rabbis and the Jewish people, it's 
this idea of authority, binding and loosing, is this uh, idea of kind of being able to make administrative decisions, disciplinary decisions. You can enforce the rules, and you can excommunicate. You can excommunicate someone from the community. And so binding and loosing is this kind of governance type of a um, language, um, to put it simply. You can probably dive into it a lot more, but that's kind of the, the gist of what it means. And so Jesus is giving them this authority of his kingdom. But to Peter, it's very unique. He gives him the keys, which no one else, no other human person is given. So he gives them the keys to the kingdom. And then he gives them this singular authority. I'll put uh, singular authority. And then he gives the apostles as a group, kind of almost kind of like this group authority. Uh, group is probably you know, my own word, group authority. And I'll come back to that here in a second, like what that may suggest. And the way Jesus phrases the words to Peter specifically does call to mind the words of the prime minister, specifically those keys. The keys was kind of that identifier for whoever that prime minister was of the Old Testament. And so as I said, what is the role of the prime minister? It's especially once the king has to leave for a time, he becomes in charge of the kingdom. And he, he can't act on his own power. I mean, he can't do something the king doesn't want. Um, he needs to be speaking for the king and standing in for the king, but he is there on the authority of the king to still kind of govern and guide and rule the kingdom while the king is away. And once the king comes back, the king is back in charge. And this prime minister would be called a father to the people. He would have this um, clothing that would make him stand out a little bit. Um, and so it wouldn't surprise us that that's how the apostles, who were all Jewish, understood what was happening with Peter. And I don't have time to get into all the evidence today, but you, you can look and see all the different ways in the New Testament that there is this uniqueness to Peter. And so he is basically what he calls like this chief apostle, um, or talk about this, he's like the preeminent apostle. Um, and then people also refer to this as kind of like the primacy of Peter. It does not mean that he still wasn't united to the group, but there was this uniqueness to his role among the other 12. That he had this primacy, this preeminence. There's a lot of evidence for that. If you, we can talk about it more again if, if there's questions. But he is kind of called out uniquely as this. And so what the church understands this to, to be is that it is possible for Peter to make authoritative decisions about faith and morals on his own, by himself. He could do that. Or you could have Peter with all the other 11 making a decision together about faith and morals. And so you kind of have this understanding of how this authority can work. Either, either Peter uniquely or Peter with the other 11 could make these decisions together that would be bound and loosed. So bound in heaven or loosed. Okay. Um, now so I'm going to jump centuries ahead, but what the church also recognizes too is that Peter and the apostles are eventually going to appoint successors because they're not going to live forever. There's going to be a point where they are going to die. And so the, the apostles appoint men to basically be their successors, to, to rule the communities once they die, but also because the church was growing. So you had more and more communities needing governance. And so they would appoint, Peter and the apostles appointed men, chosen men to be their successors. You have the, uh, I'll put Peter plus the 11. So I'm going to call out Peter. Peter plus the other apostles. And so they started to appoint men to be their successors. So these successors to the apostles. And these are called the bishops. The bishops. The bishops, if you hear the word bishop in the Catholic Church, it's the successor to the apostles. And it means like all of our bishops today can trace their ordination all the way back to an apostle. Um, it's not by blood or by, or by um, birth, it's by ordination. So when a man is made a bishop, so he's typically already a priest, been ordained a priest, then he's ordained to the, um, to the bishopric, the 
episcopacy. So you have men, other bishops come and lay hands on him, and that's ordination. So through ordination, the bishops can trace themselves back to all the apostles. And so the apostles, like maybe you have Peter and Matthew, they may ordain Paul. I don't know who ordained Paul, the bishop, but let's say Paul. And then you would have Timothy was another bishop in the early church. So Paul, a bishop, maybe he had Peter with him. And so Paul and Peter ordained Timothy, a bishop. And I'm making that up as far as, I don't know who ordained Timothy. But the point is, like, the apostles, through ordination, ordained these other men to be bishops. And then century after century, these bishops continue this line of ordination until the bishops you have today. And this is most visible in Peter. Um, you can really see this very clearly with Peter. So Peter, because he was unique, in Peter's lifetime, he, he was Bishop of Antioch for a little while, and then he eventually became Bishop of Rome, and he died as a martyr for the faith in Rome, as Bishop of Rome. And so that is the Bishop of Rome, so Rome is now referred to like the see of Peter, the see meaning like his place of office. So the Bishop of Rome, when Peter died, he was the Bishop of Rome, and when Peter died, they appointed a successor of Peter to be Bishop of Rome. The first man, successor was a man named Linus, then there was Cletus, then there was Clement, and historically you can find this entire list all the way to today with Francis. So Pope Francis is the 265th successor of St. Peter. So he's the 266th Pope, if you count Peter. But he's the 265th successor of Peter. If you go to Rome, there's a church called St. Paul outside the walls, right outside the walls of Rome. And you can see in the ceiling, all the way around, wrapped around, they have little face icons of all the different popes, all the different successors of Peter throughout the centuries. And you can go online and find this list of all of them. And what that's trying to do is showing this continuing tradition, um, this continuing succession, so that you can see how Francis is connected to Peter. And that linkage is really important. And so we call that apostolic succession because the bishops are to um, be a witness um, that they are continuing to hand down the faith that Christ gave to the apostles. So Christ gives the apostles the faith. He teaches them, gives them the fullness of the faith. The apostles hand it down to these bishops who they're, who they're ordaining to continue this trend, continue this um, tradition of handing down the faith. And so bishop after bishop is continuing that. And so the Bishop of Rome is the same idea. Where you can see this lineage, um, this linkage from the current bishops and the current pope to, to the apostles. And then over time, the Bishop of Rome came to be referred to as the pope. And the pope is kind of this English transliteration of papa. What is papa? It means father. Well, it shouldn't surprise us that he's called father. He is kind of, he's like this Old Testament prime minister who was also called father when the king was away. Now in the early church, all the bishops often were called papa, were called father, but over time it became singularly the pope who became uh, papa, the father of the church, the pope of the church, to really call to mind his succession to Peter, who has this unique primacy among all the apostles. And all the apostles, all the bishops of the world, all the successors of the apostles, should still be united. If they're not united to each other, then they're separating themselves from Christ. And so all the bishops of the world today need to be united to the successor of Peter in order to show that they're still faithful to Christ and to his church because there's this hierarchy that needs to be respected. And it's not a hierarchy where people are submissive or someone's more important in the sense of human dignity or, um, or things like that. And the bishops, like Bishop Strickland of the Tyler, Diocese of Tyler, he has governance of this diocese. The Bishop of Houston can't tell Bishop Strickland what to do in Tyler Diocese, necessarily. The Bishop Strickland, is, he has to teach the faith and morals of the church, and he can't change those. But for administrative things and governance things, this is his, um, we are his sheepfold. And he's in charge of that. Not the Bishop of Houston, but Bishop Strickland. So all the dioceses that existed, they were created over time because of how big the church got. But the Pope is different. So the Pope does have his bishop, his diocese of Rome, but he also has this universal um, authority as well because 
it, again, it's kind of showing how Peter had this unique role among the apostles. And he was to be a sign of authority and a sign of unity um, among all of them, if that makes sense. Awesome. Yes. Who is our archbishop? It's going to be the Houston Galveston one, um, Donardo. So, and an archbishop is more just kind of like governance, trying to help with some of the organization. Doesn't mean that he would have governance of the Diocese of Tyler, but it's, it's just kind of just trying to help keep things organized and uh, because it's gotten so big. Um, and then the cardinals are different. Cardinals um, are those particular, typically today's bishops. Men are, certain bishops are appointed cardinals, and the cardinals are the ones who elect the next pope. That's the main role of the cardinals, to elect, to elect the pope. And over the centuries, it hasn't always been simply bishops, but that's typically the tradition today. And so with this kingdom, you kind of see Jesus is the king, and then you have his kind of right-hand man, the, the, pri the prime minister, in a sense, is, is Peter, and then the successors to Peter. And then you have the apostles, who were established early on, the twelve, and then their successors to the bishops. Um, and the bishops are not apostles, they're not... Um, we keep them separate just because the 12 apostles had a very distinct role in the life of the church. But the bishops are successors to the apostles. And then they all, um, this is how the kind of the church is governed. And, it's, and so they help to guide the people. They guard the deposit of faith. On your handouts, I put a lot of different scripture passages to kind of show you some of these things. So that it's not just my word. But you'll see how in St. Paul's writings, in Acts chapter 1 verse 20, the first time we see that word bishopric or bishop is when Matthias is chosen. And Matthias is chosen to, re to, to replace Judas, the bishopric of Judas. So there's this idea that there's this office of a bishop. And then Paul will talk several other times about this office of bishop. And he will talk about this office, like for Timothy. He talks about Timothy being a bishop and how one of his um, duties is to guard the, guard the truth, guard the faith. And, and Paul will tell Timothy, Guard what I have entrusted to you. And this entrusted thing that he's talking about is like the deposit of faith. Um, all the, the fullness of truth that Christ gave to the apostles, that Christ gave to Paul, that are now being given to these bishops who are supposed to guard it and protect it and preserve it and hand it on. Um, and that way, too, these bishops can be responsible for interpreting scripture and using all the, the deposit of faith that they've been given and entrusted with to help try to make sure they guide the faithful to correct interpretation, to correct understandings, to know what it was that Christ actually taught. And that way, 2,000 years later, we can still know the truth that Christ had given to us. Um, and so that's kind of the significance of the bishops, is to govern, to, we we'll call it like to sanctify. So sanctifying means they offer mass and, and the sacraments, they can ordain priests. So bishops are to sanctify and to govern, um, and they're to protect, and they're to teach, they're to protect that faith. And so the bishops have a very significant role in the church. Um, let's see. So a lot more that can be said, but I think that kind of gives you at least a, a, a sense for the structure of the church and how we start to um, understand it and explain it as far as the hierarchical part of it. Um, I guess the final thing I could say is just um, is the reality that I know um, for, for many people who aren't Catholic today, many Christians who aren't Catholic today, they don't fully understand the role of the church. And oftentimes they think that, um, and at least they've kind of talked to me too about the significance of just having the Bible. And that the Bible is really all we need. We don't really need this church, and as long as we're all united in our belief in Jesus, that's all we really need. But if you look back in, in the way, in the early church, the way that Christ had kind of established things, I think it's important to note. So if Jesus, you know, he died, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and then the apostles go off to so Pentecost, and the apostles go out and start preaching and teaching. So for that first century, so we'll put... Jesus is here at the cross, here's 100 AD. So they go, the apostles start to go out and preach and teach and go to the world. When's probably the first time that something was ever written down in the New Testament? They had the Old Testament, but the New Testament took time to write. Most scholars will say it's at least minimum 
10 years, but that's probably on the short end. It's probably 10 to 40 years before really you start to see things being put in writing. St. Paul, some of St. Paul's letters are probably the first to be written. Um, and people have different dates as far as when these uh, things were written. It's not significant for our purposes, but at least no sooner than 48. That's really the early end of the spectrum. But you have the 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. We know they were finished by here because John um, wrote the book of Revelation probably sometime around 90 to 100 AD. So the New Testament is finished at the end of that century, but all throughout here is when you have the books being written, written at different times. So maybe in the 50s and the 60s the 70s, depending on the different scholars that you read. But the key thing is that for at least 10 years, they had no Bible. They didn't have the New Testament. Um, they had the Old Testament, that was it. They didn't have the Bible as we know it. So for at least 10, but probably even longer than that, without really any writings. And even if we say that the, the last book was written here, in reality, they didn't have the Bible like we have it until 400 AD. Because for the next several centuries, they're trying to figure out, there's a whole lot of letters and gospels being written that are forgeries, or written by heretics, and they're floating around all these different communities. So you may have St. Paul wrote to the Corinthians over here, he wrote to the Ephesians over here. They're not necessarily sharing letters constantly, and they do copy them and try to get them spread to, to the different Christians. Um, but you also have the Gospel of Thomas that crops up. And then you may have some of these other things written by heretics that take the name of some of the apostles trying to make it sound authentic, but they're heresies, they're all false. Well, the average lay person, like one of us, would not have known exactly what to believe. We would look to our bishop to know, is this trustworthy? Is this not trustworthy? What is this document I'm reading? And it took time. Because also what's happening from about 66 or so AD, um, 66 until 313 or so, what's happening? The church is being persecuted off and on. So the church is being persecuted off and on, so it's not like they can get out and, and have councils and figure this all out. And so the bishops are somewhat limited in travel, and they can't do a lot of public assembly at times. So you have a lot of chaos. Then finally, when they can finally start to gather and meet, they have start having councils where the bishops come together and start to settle disputes. Well, one of the biggest disputes is about Jesus and who he was. And then about the Trinity, like we talked about last week. And so they understand there's a question about what books are inspired, but it's really not settled until around 400 AD. There's a couple of small councils through here, and then Pope Innocent I, right after the year 400, writes this letter to um, this bishop who had asked, what books should Jerome put in the Bible? And he responds, and he has the 73 books. And so you finally start to see what books the church holds to be inspired and good to read and faithful and authentic, but it took time. So my point is, like during this time, there really wasn't a Bible like we know today. We take that for granted sometimes. It was the church that people looked to. The people looked to the church, to the bishops, um, to the leaders of the church, as to what, what do I believe? And what, what's, what are the true things about the faith? What are the morals? And especially during up until 100 AD, when you don't have all the books being finished, but even for several hundred years, there's a lot of questions about what we believe, and then we look to the church. And so it shouldn't surprise you that, the last thing I'm going to say is on your hand, I'll put this quote there. It shouldn't surprise you that whenever St. Paul speaks about the church, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, he says that it's the church of the living God that's the pillar and foundation of truth. So it's the church. It's not the Bible, or it's not a book, it's not letters, it's not a person singularly a human person, it's the church who is the foundation of truth. That's where you need to look if you're not sure of what, what the answer is. What was and, that scripture? Um, 1 Timothy 3.15. Okay. And then one that kind of blows me away sometimes is Ephesians chapter 3, um, verse 10, where Paul writes that it's through the church that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known. So it's through the church that this manifold wisdom of God might be made known. And so it's very telling what, how Paul sees the church and the importance of the church. Um, is that it's really the church you look to. And then the church's job is to take these inspired scriptures and to protect them and to guard them, to make sure that if possible people have access to them. If people don't have access to them, at least be preaching and teaching and evangelizing. 
translate the Bible when you can. And the church was translating the Bible early, early on. You can go look at all the earliest centuries of the church. When people would go to different places, they would translate. Um, I think uh, Cyril and Methodius, if I'm not mistaken, this has come out of my very back of my brain. But I think they traveled to countries and invented language to be able to teach them the gospel. Um, or learn the language to be able to translate it to teach people. So the church is really, really wanting people to know the Bible. But she also knew that even if you don't have the Bible, the church can teach you the fullness of truth. Because the church has been given that fullness of truth to hand on to people. And the church would teach it both orally, by word of mouth, and written. So written is the Bible. But a lot of what the church taught, especially early on, was by word of mouth. So last thing I'm going to say, I promise, I'm going on. One of the things that really highlights how important oral teaching was to the early church is in um, John, his first letter. In the first letter of John, chapter 2, um, or, or is it 2 John? 2 John 12. So 2 John 12. This is really telling. Because what John does, so he's writing to these Christians of, of some community, and he tells them, I have so much to tell you. I have so much to write to you. But instead of writing, I'm going to come teach you face to face. We're going to come talk. I'm going to come talk to you face to face. So John tells them, I have so much to tell you, but I'm going to come teach face to face. Because there's a huge benefit of face to face conversations. If people misunderstand, you can correct and you can start to analyze things. There's a lot you can learn face to face. Written word is great because it can be spread, but you also have to understand there's misinterpretations, mistranslations. And that's why Paul, in, um, and I have all these on your handouts, but in um, 1 Thessalonians, um, yeah, or actually 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, so 2 Thessalonians 2, 15, Paul says to the Christians, hold fast and stand firm to the traditions that you were taught by us, meaning him and the bishops and the apostles, Hold fast you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by letter. Because Paul had already written to the Thessalonians once. He knew there was this letter he wanted them to hold fast to. So there's some writings that are starting to trickle around, but also what you heard by word of mouth. Because he says in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, because he says, when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it as what it really is, the word of God. So he recognized that the church was able to teach the word of God, by, by word of mouth. So it wasn't just written where you find the word of God. The word of God was also when the bishops and the apostles would teach faithfully what it was that Christ had taught about faith and morals. And, and, and so he said, what you accepted is what it really is, the word of God. So I'll conclude with that. A lot more can be said, but it's just to emphasize the church really has this important role that she isn't she would kind of look at, she's the custodian of scripture. So she's the guardian, the protector, the custodian of scripture. Um, but she's also more than that. Um, she also has these oral traditions that she keep, keeps in mind. And both the oral traditions and the written traditions can't contradict. They both help to make up the fullness of faith that Christ imparted to the church to hand down to us today. Okay. All right, I will stop there. Any questions? I'm sure there's a lot, but... If you have anything you want to ask now, we can ask him, and if not, I can stick around if you want to come up here privately and ask. Well, I can tell you this. This is one of the classes I missed when I came through RCA the first time. It's like, all of a sudden, if I had heard this, magisterium, the concept of magisterium would not have been such a mystery to me, and I have really struggled with that. But this makes it all so clear. <laughs> yeah, so she used the word magisterium. So if you haven't heard that, magisterium is just the teaching office of the church. So magisterium. So it, it encompasses the pope and the bishops. Um, but it's this teaching office of the church. Because that's one of her very important roles. But good, I'm glad that helped. Other questions? Yes, sir. The, the older priesthood, what happened to all that? The what? The older priesthood that was leading. The Jewish priesthood? Yeah, what happened to all that? How does it relate to all that? So, <laughs> um, so the, 
If you remember when Jesus said that he came not to abolish but to fulfill, right? So um, it's a good question because Jesus did establish a priesthood to fulfill the old priesthood. So he did not want the Old Testament Jewish priest, priesthood to continue. It was going to be fulfilled in his church. And so his church now has priests. And the priests are the bishops. So the pope and the bishops are all priests. And they have the authority to ordain other men to be priests as well. So, for example, I know David was sitting back there a minute ago. So one of our seminarians, he's a man who feels a call to become a priest. And so he's going through seminary training. And what Bishop Strickland has the authority to do is to ordain him a priest. So by the office of his episcopacy, being a bishop, he's been given that power by Christ to ordain priests. A priest is not a bishop. But a bishop is always a priest. So um, there's that back and forth. And so um, one of the clues that the Old Testament priesthood is not something that Jesus intended to continue really could be seen, I would say, in um, 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. So the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans, and it's never been able to be rebuilt. And there have been people that have tried, and if you read about... Um, What's his name? It's just, I think it's, uh, what's his name? Oh, my mind is blanked. But there's this um, really evil emperor. I think his name is Justin something. You remember Justin, um, not just a martyr, he was a saint. But uh, it was Justin. Anyways, I'll think about it in a minute. But there was this somewhere, 200, 300, there was this emperor who had been Catholic, but he was so angry that he revolted from the church. I think it was around 360, if I'm not mistaken. So somewhere around there. Um, he revolted from the church, so he even, because he'd been baptized, he hated it so much, he, I think he got some animal's blood and poured it on him to try to reverse his baptism. He hated the church. And so what he was intent on doing is rebuilding the temple. He was intent on rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem, but every time he tried, crazy things happened, like fireballs came and killed men, and earthquakes happened. He couldn't rebuild the temple. And so people have tried it over time, and they can't rebuild it. Um, and so... The destruction of the temple was almost like this point of emphasis that God is saying, no, the old priesthood has now been fulfilled in the new, in the new priesthood. And that new priesthood is the, the apostles first who ordained the bishops who can ordain priests. And we do see that on the Last Supper is when Jesus kind of ordained the apostles to be priests because he, he called them to offer sacrifice. And that sacrifice is the Mass. And that sacrifice is the participation in that Passover, in the new Passover. And so um, every time the priest says Mass, he's offering a sacrifice, the sacrifice of the Mass. We're not killing Jesus over and over again. But it's, it's, the church refers to it as like an unbloody sacrifice. Um, but the Eucharist is also our participation in that once and for all sacrifice on Calvary. So the... the the Passover that Jesus celebrated and his death on the cross, they're, they're connected. And so our participation in Mass and the Eucharist is our participation in this once-for-all sacrifice that Christ offered. And so the priests, the bishops and the priests, they're the ones who offer this sacrifice in the Mass because it's Jesus' new priesthood. Just like the Old Testament priests, as I had mentioned earlier, could, could God would forgive sins through them. It's somewhere in Leviticus, I want to say 19, but in Leviticus there's this passage where a man is told to bring this animal to be sacrificed to the priest because of his sins, and that God would forgive the man through the intervention of the priest in that sacrifice. So the same thing is happening with confession, where God is, a, God is working through the priest. It's not the priest as a human being who has any power. God's forgiving our sins through that priest. And that's a conversation for another day, but it's but that's this idea where this whole priesthood is now fulfilled in a new way, um, in a more profound way, through the apostles and their successors, the bishops and priests. So that makes sense. But that Jewish priesthood does not exist in the church anymore. And the reason I say the temple being destroyed was significant, because one of the most important roles of the Levitical priests was to what? Offer sacrifice. The only place that could be offered was the temple. They can't offer sacrifices anywhere else. So once the temple was destroyed, there was nowhere for them to offer sacrifice. So that's why today you won't have the Jewish people offering sacrifice. They don't have the Levitical priest who can offer sacrifice. So instead of celebrating the Passover sacrifice, they celebrate the Seder, which is not a sacrifice. It's just they don't have the temple to be able to kill the lambs that are needed 
for that sacrifice. So once that temple was destroyed, it was kind of, in a way, like God saying that that's been fulfilled. There's a new priesthood um, that fulfills the old. And so it, do, it, doesn't, it no longer exists in the church that Jesus established. But good question. All right, other questions? All right, well, let's just conclude in prayer. And if other people have questions, come on up again, and, and I can stick around. Um, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen.